just I'm joking with you, or am I? Okay, folks, hi. In this, we're going to be chatting about conflict and debate. When I say conflict and debate, I don't mean like conflict, like between your partners, like, you know, someone is like, you know, like someone is like, oh, wow, I hate your arguments, man. Shut up. My contention is better. That's not the type of conflict we're going to be talking about. The type of conflict we're going to be talking about is the type of conflict that's like, you know, war and like, you know, the like, rifles and stuff like that. Specifically, we're going to be looking at three different types of conflict and the dynamics of those wars slash types of conflict and how you make arguments about them in debate. The first thing we're going to chat about is what's known as sectarian conflicts or sort of ethnic identity-based conflicts. These are things like the Sunni-Shia conflict that you see in the context of the Middle East. These are things like, for example, inter or intra-religious conflict, like for example, in the country of Nigeria. This is conflict that is waged across ethnic lines, across cultural lines, across racial lines. And we're going to talk about the dynamics of those conflicts and how to make interesting arguments about them. We're secondly going to be talking about asymmetric conflicts. These are conflicts that generally tend to feature sort of guerrilla rebel movements against larger state forces. So think, for example, terrorism. Anyone ever heard of terrorism? Yeah. Um, some, some people would say that a good member speech that has lots of reputations is a de facto terrorist debate speech. Not really. Just kidding. You know, because like you're like terrorizing your. OK, anyways, I digress. Uh, and lastly, we're going to talk about interstate conflicts. These are like the things that make like sexy movies, right? Like, you know, Star Wars. That's the only movie I know that has like wars in it. I don't watch a lot of movies. Um, yeah, but that's basically the gist of it. The fact that I seriously got 15 people um, to um, um, like, you know, like actually show up for this is crazy. That is like so wild. I can't even tell you. I have 17 people that I somehow stole to watch this. Ha! Sucks for all those other presenters. We're going to have a blast. Um, uh, not actually a uh, not actually a blast. I mean, we're going to be talking about conflicts, which I guess include blasts. Uh, okay. First things first, sectarian, ethnic, religious, cultural, racial conflicts, you name it. So the question that you're probably asking yourself is like, what on earth is a sectarian conflict? Now, if you Google this, it'll tell you a conflict that is sectarian is a conflict over sects, which doesn't really help. And it also sounds like it's saying conflict over sex, which it's not. But conflict between different sects basically means when you have different identity groups that engage in some form of combat, some form of warfare. What does that look like exactly? To be clear, this is often intrastate conflict. So for example, in the fine country of Rwanda, back in uh, 1994, a huge genocide broke out or massive conflict took a hold of the country in what ended up becoming known as the Rwandan genocide that featured large scale ethnic violence between two different ethnic groups, the Hudus and the Tutsis. The Sunni Shia conflict is a conflict between two different branches of Islam. One of them is Shia, one of them is Sunni, and they too engage in sort of a sectarian form of conflict. Great question in chat on like, to what extent is genocide intrinsically sectarian? We're going to talk about that in just a second. Now, there's a few different ways in which conflicts can have sectarian dynamics. And these are all good things to think about whenever you're in debates about war. The first thing that's, I think, useful and important to think about is that different factions in a conflict might not be explicitly defined by their allegiance to a particular group, but are still very much so dominated by that group. So for example, if you look at Iraq in the context of 2006, so the context for this, by the way, guys, is in 2003, the United States decided to be a real dick, and then Dick Cheney decided to bring the United States into Iraq. The United States invades Iraq, topples Saddam Hussein, imposes a transitional government. By the way, the transitional government actually sucks ass, and they do a terrible, terrible job. Like, there's just fun, like, little story. The United States gives, like, $50 billion of development aid to Iraq to try to rebuild Iraq. And then randomly one day, they're like, where on earth did some of this money go? And they find over a billion dollars in cash, in suitcases, in a random basement in Jordan. Like, that's how bad this transitional government is. I digress. But the gist basically is that you have different sort of factions within a conflict. And just to be clear, when I say factions, what I basically mean is different groups. Think ethnic groups, racial groups, religious groups, that type of thing. And in the context of Iraq, post the US invasion, there's a huge civil war that breaks out. 
And it doesn't break out because necessarily of ethnic tensions. It really breaks out as a consequence of the instability brought about by the US intervention, but it's waged across these sort of Sunni and Shia sects. The second thing that often defines sectarian conflicts is their use of rhetoric. And this is something we're going to talk about later because the big thesis of this presentation, the big thing I want to take away is basically that ethnic conflicts or religious conflicts or racial conflicts are almost never actually about those differences. They're actually just conflicts over money or war or, or power or land. And oftentimes those conflicts are just justified through the sort of lens of ethnicity. So for example, if you look back in the 1990s, there was this country, it was called Yugoslavia. And Yugoslavia had these six different republics and they were each dominated by a different ethnic group. And one of those republics was known as Serbia. And this dude comes to power in Serbia, his name is Slobodan Milosevic. And he basically instigates a huge amount of Serbian nationalism. The Serbs are an ethnic group within the region. And what Milosevic does is he basically more or less in effect starts a series of brutally bloody wars that end up becoming known as the Yugoslav Wars. And although the people on the ground, the soldiers, the civilians that are fighting in those wars certainly view those conflicts as being sectarian in nature in the sense that it is us, the Serbs against them, the Croats. In reality, it's really a war that is being fought for political or power-based reasons. And the rhetoric just happens to be ethnic slash sectarian in nature. So it's things like this other ethnic group wants to oppress you. You're not safe around these people. We need to fight. Them. Lastly, conflicts, and this is a generally good thing to keep in mind whenever you're debating about conflicts or any form of war. It's very, very rare in the modern day for a war just to be fought. In the modern day, it's much more common for a war to break out in different major global powers to subsequently play a role in funding that conflict. Can anyone think of a very famous historical example of a conflict or a series of conflicts in which major global powers played a role? Yeah, um, Shreyas. Um, the Cold War. Brilliant, for sure, for sure, for sure. The Cold War is everyone's favorite example of a proxy conflict. Why is it everyone's favorite example of a proxy conflict? Easy. Because the United States, the Soviet Union, kapow, 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 big old sect, uh, big old, um, you know, proxy war. And nowadays, a large number of those proxy conflicts, which still continue to exist in places like, for example, Yemen, the proxy dynamics of those conflicts are also often waged across identity-based lines. So Saudi Arabia, for example, is a majority Sunni nation. And so most of the support that Saudi Arabia provides in the war in Yemen is to Sunni militias and to the Sunni government. Iran, which is competing with Saudi Arabia for regional influence, is overwhelmingly Shia. And guess what? Iran tends to back, for example, the Shia majority Houthi rebels in the region. So the question you're probably asking is, okay, great, Ryan, dude. Okay, that's what ethnic conflict is. What does this look like? What are some examples you can refer to or use in debate? Nigeria is a classic example. Nigeria is a country that has, I forget how many it is. It's like an enormous number of ethnic groups. It's incredibly a diverse country. And there's a really large scale conflict which takes place in that country between the two dominant religious groups who happen to be Christians and Muslims. So for example, there is a extremely violent and horribly, horribly brutalizing terrorist group that operates in Nigeria known as Boko Haram. And they play a, a, a fairly large role in sort of stimulating that violence and justifying the fears that people have of other ethnic groups. Another example is South Sudan, which is I think uh, currently at least the, like it was recognized as independent in 2011, which I think means that it's like the most recently recognized independent country. And South Sudan has two fairly large ethnic groups. They're called the Dinka and the New Heirs. And those two ethnic groups play a really large role in what more or less is an ongoing civil war between those two different ethnic tribes. If you look at a different country, uh, this is, for example, a, a conflict more in kind of the, the Caucasus region um, within Eastern Europe slash Central Asia. Um, the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict is a conflict within this kind of little strip of land over here, flared up again in September of 2020 between more or less two different groups of people, Armenians and Azerbaijanis. Again, two different ethnic groups vying for territory. Now, all of this basically means that a lot of debates that you'll have 
especially, especially, especially whenever you're talking about global conflict, are kind of debates that are implicitly about conflicts waged across ethnic or religious or cultural or racial lines. But there's kind of an interesting thing to ask yourself, which is why do these wars get fought? And the real question that I'm trying to ask you is, do people really fight other people simply because they hate them? And to be clear, you can make a very persuasive argument that the answer is yes. You can make a very persuasive argument that the answer is no. And the most likely answer is probably somewhat kind of in the middle. Now, why is that the case? Well, here's why. Because what oftentimes gets missed, especially in debates about conflict, is that most conflicts are top-down things. And what I mean by that is most of the bloodiest conflicts that we know are conflicts, even when they're between a rebel group and a government or between different rebel groups or between different terrorist groups, in most instances, people don't necessarily inherently hate other people, but rather there are very powerful communal leaders or there are regional elites who are able to stoke up fears about different ethnic groups or different racial groups or different types of people and use that fear as the impetus for conflict. So lots of conflicts are not actually waged because group A hates group B. They're waged because elites within those two groups want political power. So for example, if you look at a lot of proxy conflicts, take for example, the war in Yemen, Saudi Arabia does not really genuinely care about which interpretation of like the descendants of Muhammad is correct. The real reason they're waging a proxy war is because they want regional influence in Yemen. Lots of conflicts are really honestly just waged over money. So for example, there's a lot of very kind of famous rebel groups in countries like the Democratic Republic of the Congo that have fought these decades long sectarian conflicts and on face, they seem to be, oh, well, different racial groups and different ethnic groups have a deeply, deeply embedded hatred for other groups. But often what it really just is, is that there are rich or relatively powerful individuals who want to become even richer and even more powerful, who are able to stoke up fears about the other groups. So the sort of Milosevic from example from before sort of applies rather nicely here. Um, there's a good question in chat, which is like, why do you, you know, if you're a country like Saudi Arabia, why do you care about things like having influence over Yemen? And the answer is obviously that countries in particular want to have a greater sphere of influence. They want more countries to be relatively politically aligned with them. And they want to dissuade the sort of encroachment of regional enemies from countries that are quite close to them. A huge number of conflicts are fought over literally just land. So if you look at, there was, for example, like a 20 year long civil war in Southern Africa in the second half of the 20th century over this country called Rhodesia, which doesn't really exist anymore, eventually became Zimbabwe kind of. But in the context of the sort of conflict over that area, it's a good thing to read about. I'd encourage you if you haven't read anything about it, but the war in Rhodesia is a war that's fought really honestly for one reason, People want land, man. And again, it's waged across racial lines and ethnic lines and even class lines, but it's really not a conflict over those things. It's a conflict over land. Perhaps the largest driver of conflict though is access and proximity to natural resources. So you guys remember that whole South Sudan thing from before, like, oh, South Sudan is fighting a big civil war. Huge part of the reason for that is because some parts of South Sudan are really, really oil rich and some parts of South Sudan are not really, really oil rich. And guess what, guys? Everyone wants to be in the part of Sudan that has all the oil because that's where you make money. So in a huge number of instances, even think about blood diamond trafficking by terrorist groups, for example, in a huge number of instances, ethnic conflicts are often not actually about ethnicity or race or culture or religion. In many instances, they're literally just about power, money, resources, land. Now, how does that actually matter in the, in the context of debate? Well, it probably means two things. I think the first thing it means in general is that you can often make a lot of very persuasive arguments about how do we actually end conflict, right? Because there's often kind of an assumption made that's just like, well, to end conflict, all that we need to do is to make people stop hating each other so much. But the reality is, unfortunately, that most conflicts seem like it is true that the soldiers on the ground, the people living on the ground, have a genuine fear of the other side. And there is a genuine 
animosity between two sides or two ethnic groups. But in very many instances, that's just been instilled within them by more powerful elites simply for the purpose of maximizing their own power. The other implication is that it oftentimes means that conflicts are heavily fueled by decades long ethnic tensions that are often caused in part or in whole by colonialism. So what people often forget about, and there's a fantastic book I'm reading right now, is it here? Yeah, it's, uh, it's called um, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, and it's kind of about the process of decolonization. Definitely recommend it. But the, the, the gist is that in lots of instances, the reason why ethnic tensions exist is not because there are two groups of people that just one day were like, I hate you. What happens much more commonly is that during periods of colonialism and imperialism by Western European countries like Britain or Spain um, or uh, you know those types of countries, in very many instances, what happened during the period of colonialism is that if you were a colonial leader, you had a really big incentive to try to pit different ethnic groups against each other. Anyone want to guess why a, a, a colonial power would want to do that? Like, if you're Britain and you're ruling over India, why do you want to make people in India that come from different groups hate each other? Uh, we'll go to Jordan for this one. Uh, well, you'd want to do that. So it's harder for them to come uh, together and rise up against uh, you. Yeah, because if they're all fighting, they can't really coordinate. Yeah, one hundred percent. This is called divide and divide and rule tactics or divide and conquer tactics, and it's brutal. Uh, and basically, what what sort of colonial forces realized was like, wait a second, if we can make everyone hate each other, they're going to kind of forget that actually we are the ones they're supposed to be hating. So in the context of India, for example, there was this instance in India where different groups within India, uh, Muslims, for example, and, and Hindus came together and almost, almost, almost drove the British out. And the British were like, oh my God, this is crazy. And so what they did was they implanted, it, it sort of implemented a, a bunch of measures to deliberately try to make different ethnic groups dislike each other. And that has very long lasting impacts. So if you look at even a country like Rwanda, for example, if you look at Rwanda's history before it became colonized, different ethnic groups coexisted quite peacefully. And there wasn't large scale conflict and there wasn't a large degree of hatred. And in very many instances, the reason why that hatred developed is as a response to or sort of implanted by the period of colonialism, which continues to impact a lot of countries nowadays. And that's often a useful thing to keep in mind when characterizing these conflicts in debate, that in very many instances, the reason why tensions exist is either manufactured by elites to justify their own power, or in many instances, it is an extension of the legacy of colonialism. And that heavily impacts how these conflicts play out. And more importantly, it also impacts how these conflicts eventually end, right? Because in a lot of wars that don't have a sectarian dimension, really all that you need to do, right, is you basically just need to like convince one side to stop fighting, right? Like, okay, game's over, you guys won, hooray, hurrah. But when conflicts are ethnically driven, for example, it's often a lot harder to get that because both sides intensely distrust each other and no, no side in a country might necessarily feel confident living under a government that the other rules. And what that means is that oftentimes the way that you solve ethnic conflicts has to place an emphasis upon healing and finding a way post-conflict to kind of heal or reconcile some of those divides. So that's why, for example, in lots of more recent instances, there have been things that are called truth and reconciliation uh, sort of commissions, like has ha has ha as has happened in places like Canada, as has happened in places like, for example, South Africa. And the goal of those TRCs, as they're called, is to allow victims of oppression, of conflict, of violence, to sort of speak out and share their stories. And the idea behind that, in part, is the way that you solve the roots of these conflicts is by addressing the underlying hatred and the underlying desire for power, et cetera. So that's kind of like general stuff on kind of ethnic conflicts and how they play out in debate. The second thing that's closely related to this is kind of terrorism and asymmetric warfare. Asymmetric warfare is sort of what happens when you have two mismatched combatants. And just to be clear, a lot of the, you know, like when I think of war, I think of the pictures of the like, you know, 
the like British armed forces rolling into America, you know, where they're like all like carrying their like rifles and stiff armed and they've got 500 soldiers marching on through. Or maybe you think of like World War One, you've got trenches and you've got like the long lines of soldiers, blah, blah, blah. Well, in the modern era, warfare has changed a considerable amount, especially given the rise of very powerful military technologies. And what that means oftentimes is that a lot of conflicts that are ongoing in the world are often waged between sort of parties that have vastly different levels of military strength. So for example, for very, very many years in the country of Colombia, there was a massive amount of conflict that sort of broke out. Um, uh, you're, you're right, Adrian. Uh, my, I love that war. Uh, okay, that was a horrible statement out of context. That war is one of my favorite wars to read about because it's fascinating. Um, they had something like, I think they had like maybe seven functional tanks at the time the Soviet Union invaded them. Like there's like literally pictures of them just like, sledding to get to like battlefront positions. I mean, there's that one amazing Finnish sniper who's just fantastic. Anyways, um, it's a topic for a different day. The, the gist though of asymmetric warfare is that what often happens is that the party or the side of a conflict that is undermatched will often engage in unconventional warfare tactics. So one of the most commonly known tactics is what's called guerrilla warfare, not spelled like guerrilla, like Harambe, Rip Harambe never forget, but rather guerrilla like G-U, it's like the G-U-E-R-I-L-L-A guerrilla warfare. And basically what guerrilla warfare or a lot of these asymmetric tactics of warfare focus on more or less is basically instead of engaging with the enemy head on, what you instead do is you engage in smaller scale acts of sort of low intensity, but frequent violence. And you sort of take shelter in relatively rural or mountainous areas, instead of waging these massive, large scale land or amphibious assaults, you sort of attack in more strategic ways. And that's what happened in the context of Colombia for many years. You had a very large and powerful rebel group um, called FARC, and you also had a series of different drug cartels. And the conflict in Colombia was never really like a big army number one meets big army number two. What happened much more commonly was that you would sort of have these FARC militants that would sort of disappear into relatively rural areas and would sort of launch these indiscriminate periodic sort of attacks against the Colombian armed forces and that would result in retaliation, yada, yada, yada. So a lot of conflicts nowadays, and this especially is important in the context of terrorism, are relatively asymmetric in their nature. Now, what I wanna then, talk about is kind of how this concept of asymmetric warfare bleeds over into debates about terrorism. And terrorism is discussed quite a bit in debate, how we combat terrorism, how we deal with terrorists. And there's a series of assumptions that are often made, not necessarily by debaters, but by like people in, in general, about how it is that we fight terrorists. There's an assumption very oftentimes that terrorists are purely irrational, they're entirely ideological. Um, they are exclusively Islamic or radicalists. And there's often an assumption that the way that we can best beat terrorism is through these sort of strong displays of force, right? Like if you ever listen to like literally a half a second of American political rhetoric talking about how we're gonna beat ISIS or Al Qaeda, it's like, we're gonna pummel them into the ground. And very oftentimes this isn't really true. And to be clear, it often is the case that terrorists meet these criteria. There are many Islamic radicalist terror groups in the world. There are some terror groups which are legitimately irrational. There are some terrorists that truthfully can only ever be eliminated through brutal sort of shock and awe displays of force. But that very arguably is not all terrorists, maybe not even a majority. In lots of instances, terrorists engage in terrorism because there are specific demands they want to be met. Now, to be clear, that's not to say those demands are per se good or per se correct. It's just to say that terrorism is often much more pragmatic than it's framed in discourse. Again, not pragmatic necessarily in a good way, pragmatic in the sense that a lot of terrorist groups are very goal oriented. They want things like land redistribution. They want things like political rights. They want things like economic welfare. So for example, in countries like Sri Lanka, there has historically been a large amount of fighting with a group called the Tamil Tigers. And it would be very easy or very lazy, perhaps, in debate to make a lot of assumptions like, oh, these are just kind of like crazy, just violent people who just engage in violence for the sake of violence. But in reality, the Tamil Tigers had very specific political and economic demands of the Sri Lankan government. 
And the way that conflict eventually came to what more or less could arguably be considered something of a close is when there was a degree of negotiation which happened between those two actors. And the big takeaway I wanna draw from all of this here is basically that when you talk about terrorism debate, it's often very useful to genuinely ask yourself the question of how are we best able to facilitate a movement eventually towards negotiation? How do we eventually get parties sitting down at the negotiating table, willing to make credible concessions to the other side? But there's a series of barriers to those negotiations that are often things that are worth considering. For one thing, terrorists are often very difficult to negotiate with because they're often very fragmented. So often that's the case that there's just lots of different groups who just engage in acts of violence. So for example, in the context of a country like Syria, there's like a bunch of just kind of different radical terrorist groups and there's no central leader they really call their own. So for example, if you look at a group like ISIS or a group like the Al-Nusra Front or a group like Al-Qaeda, in lots of instances, like they're just kind of different groups and they fight with each other even when they kind of have similar goals. And that means that terrorists are often by definition difficult to negotiate with if there isn't a sort of single figurehead or leader who can sort of effectively message things like peace deals or you need to lay down your arms, we're gonna get what we want, et cetera, to those individual combats. For a second thing, it's often very difficult to convince either side of a conflict that the other side is credibly willing to uphold their end of a peace deal. So whenever you sign a peace deal, both sides have to give something up, right? Maybe for example, you say, we're gonna stop killing people and in exchange, you're going to give us a right to vote, right? But there's a fear that if we lay down our arms, maybe the government is gonna keep on killing us or maybe the terrorists are gonna keep on killing civilians. And what that means is that oftentimes, in order to make negotiations successful, you have to be able to show the other party that you're actually willing to comply with negotiations and you're willing to be true to your word. You're willing to do what you say you're going to do, et cetera. The third barrier that often exists in the context of negotiations is political constraints. So anyone who lives basically anywhere ever and has any potential capacity for human emotion generally tends to know that people have a very strong inclination for vengeance. And to be clear, that's not entirely unfair. It makes sense. When you or your community or your loved ones face violence, face terrorism, are afraid and are constantly surrounded by fear, you're often not super supportive of governments that come in and are like, you know what, guys? Let's do a thing called negotiate with the terrorists that have been killing us for a whole long while. And what that often means is that the political constraints of voters, or even if not voters, just civilians on the ground, often does make it somewhat difficult to effectively combat terrorists or combat groups like, say, criminal syndicates or drug cartels, because there's often a political incentive to be tough on the other side, to use these brutal displays of force, even when doing that is not necessarily effective. And so it's often the case that negotiation even when it's in the best interest of a country, is often something that maybe countries aren't willing to engage in. So for example, in the context of the United States, there probably was a way to have avoided the war in Afghanistan that didn't necessarily require an invasion. There was some capacity to potentially cooperate with the Taliban and negotiate for the extradition of figures like bin Laden, but the United States opted, due to heavy political pressure to look strong and forceful, they opted instead to pursue a more retaliatory approach to signal strength, to not look weak, et cetera. Same things happen even in the context more recently of things like ISIS, right? When countries face terrorist attacks, the response, and again, I'm not criticizing this, it just tends to happen. The response overwhelmingly is that we need to strike back. We need to be strong. Um, that's why a lot of like historians, for, this is like unrelated, but like, you know, people still debate exactly why Japan committed 9-11, or that, not, that was an incorrect statement, why Japan committed the Pearl Harbor bombings in 1941. Um, and in part, like one of the things that um, people are like always been like confused by is apparently some Japanese officials thought that if we, if they bombed the United States, the United States would just be like, oh my God, they bombed us. We better stay out of the war. And everyone's like, have you freaking met America? Like, no, that's not how countries tend to respond to these types of displays of force. Um, and so what that means oftentimes is that the third barrier to effective negotiation is that political figures often don't want to look weak. They often don't want to look like they're bowing down to the other side, et cetera.
So all of this means that there's a lot of barriers to negotiation. And oftentimes, I actually do think a very effective strategy in debate rounds is to lay out a case for why your side is better able to uh, uh, accomplish negotiation or put a real dent into um, uh, you know, into the into the you know ability of a terror group to continue waging violence, et cetera. So TLDR, long story short, you can often make a more interesting and more nuanced series of arguments about terrorist groups by characterizing their interests and their structure a little bit more um, effectively. The last thing I'll chat about, and I don't have a slide on this, I apologize, but because uh, I admittedly think that this actually comes up relatively less commonly, but obviously in some instances there is conflict between different countries. So this is most obviously the more recent conflict between Ukraine and Russia, but it also takes place more or less whenever there are direct invasions of other countries, whenever there's territorial border skirmishes, so on and so forth. Um, and there's, I think, two sort of very common debates that tend to come up here. One debate that you'll get a lot is everyone's, what, what's, every, what's every policy debater's favorite argument ever? Low probability, high magnitude. Anyone want to guess what's, what's, what's everyone's favorite, favorite argument? It's like the meme. What's like the meme? Nuclear argument? war. Yeah, nuclear war. Nukes. Woohoo. Nah, pew, pew, pew. Um, so nuclear war is like one of the classic things that gets discussed in the context of interstate uh, warfare. And the idea of interstate conflict basically more or less is, is more or less just that when countries go to war, they either have nukes or they don't. Uh, and when countries engage in conflict and they're both nuclearly armed, so, for example, there's been a lot of border uh, skirmishes between India and Pakistan. There's been border skirmishes between India and China. All those three countries are nuclearly armed. Um, whenever there's conflict between countries that have nuclear weapons, it tends to be relatively limited. Uh, the classic argument for that, of course, is what's called, that's so mad, bro. MAD, mutually assured destruction. Ha, ha, ha. Um, but there's obviously a, a, you know, a lot of critiques of the doctrine of mutually assured destruction. Probably the most interesting sort of criticism of, of mutually assured destruction that I think you can, you'll, you'll stumble across in debate is mutually assured destruction in very many instances really only means that countries are deterred from launching nukes at other countries, but not necessarily deterred from going to actual war with the country. So let me give you an example. If hypothetically the United States landed a invasion force in China, not that they're going to do it, it would be stupid, but hypothetically, if the United States did, a lot of you know, contemporary theorists would be like, the United States wouldn't do that because then you know, China would respond by nuking the United States. But would they really? Like it's possible. But if you're China, if you think that you even have a 4% chance of surviving that conflict, you're not going to nuke the United States because you know the second that you launch a nuke at the United States, the United States is going to launch a nuke back at you and then boom, you're both dead. So if you're China and you think that you have any chance of beating the United States and winning that invasion, then you're probably not going to actually launch nuclear weapons. The other criticism, of course, of mutually assured destruction is to what extent are nukes actually the thing that deters countries um, from going to war? i.e. to what extent is it actually the case that countries don't fight because of nukes versus because of the other bazillion powerful military technologies that countries have, right? So it would kind of be like, you know, if you're like walking home from school one day and then like some like punk stands up and is like, I'm going to punch you. And then like, you know, you're like, oh, you shouldn't punch me because I have, and then you like, like rip off your shirt and you're like totally shredded and you have like 7,000 like pounds of muscles or whatever. And then you're like, see my right bicep forearm? That's not a muscle, but I said it as if it was. Um, you know, it would be like, is that like the thing that the punk is going to be like, whoa, I can't punch this dude. His right forearm bicep thing is so jacked, right? Like maybe it's the case that you're just like a totally like shredded person in general that, you know, you're not going to fight them or whatever. So stupid analogy, but the argument more generally is maybe countries wouldn't have gone to war anyway. And maybe the whole, oh, well, there hasn't been a major conflict since World War II between massive states. Maybe that argument is really more correlation with the fact that military technologies become increasingly powerful as opposed to uh, as opposed to nukes. The classic um, uh, other thing though I think that people forget about with nukes is um, it's not just the case that nuclear weapons uh, uh, are used by countries that uh, actually have them. There's always a perpetual fear of nuclear weapons falling into the hands of terrorists who actually would probably be more willing to use them. And obviously there's another concern, which is that in most instances, countries are protected by the nuclear umbrella of other countries. And what that basically just means is that most countries on planet Earth do not have nukes. 
but they have alliances with countries that do. And in most instances, there's kind of a tacit quid pro quo that's like, if hypothetically, you know, a strong US ally gets nuked, even if that country doesn't per se have nuclear weapons, eh, it's probably the case that the United States would still nuclearly retaliate in some sort of capacity. Yeah, you are right, Adrian. The United States has lost nuclear weapons, which is, you know, kind of scary. And, you know, in case any of you have seen those nuclear weapons, you should probably call the White House and let them know. I mean, they should just ask themselves, where's the last place that you saw it? Anyways, uh, the second thing that comes up quite a bit, though, whenever talking about interstate conflicts is kind of the response to conflicts. So what happens when country A invades country B, like, you know, Putin and Russia? Uh, and the general response is that countries tend to respond with sanctions. They tend to respond by targeting the invading country with things like embargoes, with things like travel sanctions, with things like condemnations. But they also, in some instances, will do things like the United States and the EU is doing right now, provide military aid to the rebels. They'll often attempt to do things like sponsor uh, peace deals and negotiations, as countries like Israel and Turkey have offered to do. And you'll often see, in general, a pretty large degree of support for other measures that are intended to penalize the sort of intervening nation. Now, obviously, the reason why these measures are often ineffective is because there's a sort of economic mutually assured destruction effect, right? Think about it. Is the United States ever going to impose crippling sanctions on China? Eh, probably not, because if they're going to cripple China, they're probably going to cripple the United States as well. And the United States don't want to cripple the United States because the United States is the United States. Um, but more seriously, it's often difficult to robustly enforce sanctions. So, for example, North Korea. Basically, every country in the freaking world is like, North Korea, what on earth are you doing? But then guess what? China at some point in time was like, wait a second. If we just like kind of hashtag don't enforce the UN sanctions, we get to make a hell of a lot of oil money and we stabilize the Korean Peninsula. Win, win, win. So all of that more or less means that in very, very many instances, um, uh, like, you know, there's kind of lots of problems when it comes to the enforcement of sanctions. Countries find ways around sanctions. They're able to find ways to evade sanctions. They're often able to turn to other countries like, say, China or Russia or Iran or Antarctica. Just kidding, not Antarctica, I think. Uh, and that often dilutes the efficacy of those types of things. In the strongest instances, there sometimes might be an invasion, i.e. you might, for example, have like countries that will do things like launch an invasion. So the United States invaded uh, Haiti, for example, in the aftermath of a military coup in the 1990s. You've seen global military interventions into places like Yugoslavia during the war in Bosnia. But this is very rare because it's very unlikely in most instances that countries are willing to sacrifice their own soldiers for people in far off countries, which often they don't have a ton of empathy for. And the existence of the UN Security Council veto for Russia, the United States, China, etc., often makes it very difficult for the UN to work well on this, etc. All right. Oh, no, Ryan, what are you doing? Okay, close out of this. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, Shreyas, question. Uh, yeah. Um, is there any way to effectively sanction a country without necessarily harming the civilians itself? Because I remember one of the criticisms of like, uh, over, I don't know a whole lot about sanctions, but just like what I've heard is that like one of the criticisms of like uh, sanctioning Russia a lot was that it might end up hurting civilians who haven't actually like done anything. Yeah, for sure. Uh, let me grab you a dot. Wait, what, uh, what's it called? Let me grab you. I have a full document on this with a bunch of examples that you can reference at your leisure. Uh, where is it? Ryan? Ryan? There it is. Aha. Uh -huh. um, oops. Yeah, here it is. Um, this has some stock examples and like arguments for and against sanctions, et cetera. Um, wait, did I put that in chat? I think so, yeah. Um, anyways, but uh, the kind of like main thing I'd say is that you can often make arguments in support of sanctions by targeting sanctions against specific elites or specific groups that are directly accountable or culpable for abuses. So for example, a lot of the sanctions that are currently imposed on the country of Myanmar are, are sanctions that are specifically targeted at very specific institutions like the military or the gem industry in Myanmar that have direct ties to military elites, but not necessarily to poor rural agrarian farmers on the ground. So you can often target sanctions against specific individuals who are responsible. So for example, like Putin himself has been sanctioned, oligarchs have been sanctioned, that sort of thing. And those sanctions might have some degree of spillover effect on, you know, 
people on the ground, but it tends to be at least somewhat reduced. The second thing, obviously, that you can do is you can often impose sanctions, not necessarily by taking anything away, but more so by imposing conditions on things in the future. So, for example, maybe instead of sanctioning a country like saying we're not going to buy any of the things that you you produce, you might instead say something like, well, what we'll do is we'll agree to continue giving humanitarian aid but you got to treat your people better. Otherwise, we ain't going to give you humanitarian aid. So in lots of instances, you can condition future positive measures like positive incentives through the utilization of things like, you know, uh, uh, humanitarian aid, development aid, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the kind of like last thing I'd say is that you can often accomplish a good deal through sanctions by targeting or by, by sort of like revoking specific um like arms deals, for example, or like by revoking like very specific types of services that only elites benefit from. So for example, like if you stop selling like, you know, advanced fighter jets to a country, very few people on the ground are going to be like, oh, shucks, I can't fly my F-15s anymore. God damn it. Like in most instances, that's not going to harm regular people on the ground. Uh, but it is going to cut into the ability of like a military, for example, to wage like oppressive brutalization of, of relatively disprivileged groups, et cetera. So I think the easiest way to get around all of that is basically to say, aha, we'll, we'll target sanctions. But sometimes you will have to bite the harm that like sanctions might actually cause some degree of third party collateral damage. In that instance, it's kind of a weighing debate, right? Like, will we be able to change the country and therefore make whatever bad things the country is doing less bad? If we're able to do that, maybe we'll trade off the short-term harm of sanctions hurt people in exchange for the long-term benefits of regime change or stuff of that sort, if that kind of makes sense. Does that kind of answer your question? Oh, uh, yeah. Thank you. Of course, of course. Other questions that folks have or would like to fire away? Anything at all? Could be about conflict, war, sanctions. Uh, any? Yeah, Jacqueline. Yeah, so... Uh... Uh, okay, how does like how did like China kind of like evade the sanctions without getting like backlash if they did? Yeah, so the short the, so there's two answers. Uh, the first thing is that when very powerful countries find ways to evade sanctions, they're much less able to be called out for it. Uh, like most people know that China supplies illegal oil to North Korea, but it's kind of difficult to hold China accountable for that, right? Because no one really wants to be the country that sanctions uh, uh, China. But more specifically, the way that you often get around sanctions is basically you can use a whole bunch of like really obscure and sophisticated measures to try to more or less hide or cloak the fact that you're sending shipments of goods or whatever to countries. So for example, um, let me see if I can find it. Like the New York Times a few years ago, let me see if I can find it really quick. New York Times, uh, like North Korea oil, let's see. Um, yeah, here we go. Um, it's kind of cool, but like this is like a video that kind of like takes you inside more or less like a um, like shipment of oil to North Korea. And the answer is that there's this like countries will use these incredibly complex sort of like networks of shell companies and and like unlisted LLCs and like a whole bunch of just really shady things to basically find ways to get around sanctions. Um, so sometimes sanctions are just like openly violated, like just pretty openly. Some In some instances, when countries want to be a little bit more hidden about it, they'll find kind of clever ways to like send, say, weapons into a country, even if it's technically, you know, not allowed. And obviously the other issue is that, and this isn't true per se in the context of North Korea, but in lots of instances, sanctions are imposed on groups or countries that are in or operated or involved in conflict, Right. The problem is that if you are like, guess what? Kurdish militias in Iraq, no more guns for you. The problem is that like, how do you police that, right? Not in like a, you know, like, oh, you know, like the classic like stupid op thing that teams do in debate. It's like, how do you enforce this? But seriously, right? Like if a country wants to send a shipment of weapons to like a group operating in rural Iraq, how exactly are we going to police that? The country is a de facto war zone, right? Or at least parts of it are. So in very many instances, especially in the context of ongoing combat operations, it's kind of difficult to uh, sort of police or enforce sanctions because if you want to sell weapons to, say, a militant group like Hezbollah, you're able to do it. And it's kind of hard to stop you because these are unstable regions. There's not a lot of like, you know, it's not like if you go to like the border of Syria 
there's like a well-defined customs union there. Like, all right, sir, check ID. Yep, and and we need to check all the cargo. Are you bringing in any illegal guns? Ha ha ha. Right. Like, I know it's kind of kind of sounds like a meme, but very legitimately, it's often difficult to enforce these things in a meaningful way. Um, I think the last thing I'll just say is that the paradox of sanctions in many instances is that in order to have effective sanctions regimes in place, you need to have a bunch of countries doing them. The problem is that as more and more countries have to do them, the more and more likely it is that any one of them decides to not do sanctions, because if countries stop trading with a bunch of other countries, then if you're the one country that decides to violate sanctions, the potential gains you could get from being like the one country that gets to sell North Korea oil is massive. And therefore, the paradox of sanctions is as the number of countries involved in sanctions regimes goes up, so too does the propensity for sanctions skirting because the game theoretic incentive to do so is simply greater. Um, Amrit? I was actually gonna ask about that. Um, last year, I think this is actually the in the last tournament of the year, uh, the motion was sanctions do more harm than good. In that motion, um, how would you frame the uh how'd you frame the affirmative case i just want to ask since we're already on the topic yeah yeah so the document i put in chat basically has a full case on that um so you can see my full answer there i guess uh i think the easiest way to frame arguments against sanctions is i think that very oftentimes the team that is against sanctions has to be clear that your argument when you make arguments against sanctions is not actually that you will solve the conflict. It's just that sanctions will not solve and they will make things worse. And that is an independently bad thing. At that point, I think the best thing that you can do to argue against sanctions is number one, explain why sanctions do not meaningfully affect the parties responsible for conflict. Most normally that tends to be government heads or elites, right? So it's like Putin and oligarchs in Russia are the ones truly responsible for the war in Ukraine, not random people in Russia in general, and explain why sanctions don't affect those people enough to cause regime change or to stop abuse from happening. Second, I think that you then want to explain why sanctions, given their inefficacy, are likely to cause broader harms, either to regular people on the ground or to actively worsen or embolden um, continued sort of like abuses or problematic behavior from uh, whatever government or institution happens to be engaging in those activities. So for example, like if you, if you ever get a motion that's like, you know, we should stop selling weapons to Saudi Arabia, one of the classic arguments you'll make against that would be like, well, if the United States stops selling weapons to Saudi Arabia, the answer is not, ah, Saudi Arabia stops bombing people. The answer more likely than not is simply that Saudi Arabia turns, buys weapons from some other country, but it's very plausible that now those sanctions or th those weapons are maybe worse, maybe they're deadlier, maybe they turn to even worse methods of exerting brutality, say biological or chemical warfare. And you can oftentimes make a claim that even though the problem, like say a war or oppression will exist on either side, it gets worse if we sanction. It's probably, I think, the easiest way to frame it. Um, any other questions that folks have? Gorgeous. Mm. Grapes are delicious. Bye, YouTube. We love you.